Welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Alan Little. Genocide is often called the ultimate crime, and after every tragedy, the world says it must never happen again. And yet it does. My guest today is a leading international human rights lawyer, Payam Akhavan, who made his name trying to bring justice to those responsible for war crimes in the former Yugoslavia. He believes that the international community has a duty to challenge human rights abuses wherever they occur. But is true justice ever really possible? or is it compromised by political constraints and realities? Hi, Makovan. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. You're one of the architects of a system of international justice that's still very patchy, still quite flawed in many ways. Uh, your encounter with Slobodan Milosevic, for instance, you said, when I brushed shoulders with him, I saw him as the personification of evil. I thought he'd never be brought to justice. You seem to bring a peculiarly intense personal mission, sense of personal mission to your work. Where does that come from? Is it your experience as an, uh, an exiled Iranian? Well, uh, my family belonged to the Baha'i community in Iran, uh, uh, which has been traditionally the scapegoat, uh, faced violent persecution for many years. And uh, I would say the um, uh, execution of my uncle in the summer of 1981, when I was still a child, uh, solely because of his religious beliefs as a Baha'i, left a very deep impression on me. So I think personal experiences profoundly shape the way we look at the world, and they make us realize uh, that there is a broader uh, universal meaning uh, to those personal experiences uh, and uh, I would say those intimate encounters with suffering uh, clearly opened my mind to the search for justice and the, the worst thing is the, the feeling of helplessness as a victim when you are in exile and a loved one has just been tortured to death uh, and you have the sense that uh, there is no way that you can achieve uh, any form of justice and that uh, is the beginning of a journey very often where you begin to understand that justice is, is a, a much more profound long-term struggle than we imagine it to be. So in a sense you're pursuing some of your own personal demons through these international courts? I think those personal experiences uh, uh, make us understand in a profound way why justice is important. We can't reduce human rights to an intellectual abstraction. Uh, what really motivates us uh, to achieve justice against overwhelming odds is that uh, passion, that sense of indignation. Um, and I believe that once uh, I experienced this in my own personal life, it opened me to understanding how someone in the former Yugoslavia or Rwanda or wherever else uh, may feel if someone that uh, they loved has been taken away um, uh, from them through, through violence. You helped set up something called the Iran Tribunal, which sat in The Hague in October 2012 to hear allegations of crimes committed in Iran in the decade after the Islamic Revolution of 1979. But it had no legal standing, did it? It wasn't set up by any uh, le properly constituted authority. What was the point of it? This can best be described as a truth commission in exile. Uh, the mothers uh, uh, who lost their children, who have an organization called the Mothers of Khavaran, Khavaran being a notorious mass grave outside of Tehran, uh, came to me and said, well, you're the professor of law, you're the former UN prosecutor, uh, can you do justice for us? And it was a very humbling moment because I told them that there is no court uh, that they could uh, bring their case to. And that's when we decided that we should set up our own court, which has all the trappings of a properly constituted court, a hundred witnesses, evidence, a panel of prominent judges, including the former head of the South African uh, Constitutional Court, um, and uh, to begin the process of accountability uh, and political transformation in Iran by exposing the historical truth through a credible judicial process. Did it have any effect in Iran itself? I would say the effect was remarkable because we broadcast the uh, testimony of the victims uh, through satellite television, through the internet, and as you know, Iranians are very internet savvy, they're glued to satellite television. We estimate that maybe 20 million people in Iran, for the first time ever, realized 
that in that first decade of the revolution, tens of thousands of people were executed simply because of their beliefs. And it forced the regime, after almost 30 years of denial, to admit that these crimes had indeed occurred. There was even a remarkable propaganda piece which suggested that the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei had tried to save as many political prisoners as he could. So now they have to try and uh, position him as a human rights champion, which shows that once uh, human rights and accountability becomes part of the public discourse, leaders, no matter how powerful, become answerable. But it had no legal standing. It wasn't a properly constituted judicial process. And so you're open to the charge, aren't you? That the, uh, the, w the witnesses selected themselves because there is a clear nexus here between the political imperative and the pursuit of justice. And that's something that's dogged the international courts, isn't it? That, that, that intermingling, that gray area between what's judicial and what's political. Of course. In this case, the Iran tribunal had no formal legal standing, but it had legitimacy. And sometimes legitimacy, uh, when we're talking about uh, the historical truth and shaping public opinion, is more important than uh, a legal, uh, form formal uh, sort of uh, status. Uh, but uh, there is always a delicate balance between uh, law and politics. But at the end of the day, the legal process is about ascertaining the truth uh, through objective evidence, through witness testimony, through corroboration. It is a much more focused and rigorous way of understanding phenomena than, let's say, a discussion about uh, history or, or politics or, or what have you. I mean, there's a leftist group called Rahe Karga which uh, criticized the tribunal. It said that they, they felt some victims were excluded. Uh, they questioned the transparency of the process. They want to know who funded it and so on. Mm -hmm. You are open to the charge that it was a highly politicized thing. You've muddied the waters between what's judicial and what's political. Well, um, there were a hundred witnesses uh, in a tribunal which was basically set up by the victims themselves and funded by them, uh, which is a remarkable a feat uh, of, of sort of survivors and victims uh, becoming uh, activists and, and putting together uh, a truth commission in exile, which I think is unprecedented. Uh, but when you have tens of thousands of victims, by some estimates, the number of executions are as high as 40 to 50,000, according to Professor er Ervan Abrahamian. So you are all necessarily going to be selective in terms of only being able to represent uh, uh, a slice of the truth, but and nonetheless, it's clear that you part can't of bring truth. anybody justice, really, can you? You can't. This is not. This wasn't a tribunal that promised justice. Depends on what you mean by justice. Justice isn't just putting a defendant in the dock. And uh, remember what Hannah, what Hannah Arendt said about the Nuremberg judgment. She said it explodes the limits of the law. How can you ever bring anyone to justice for crimes in that scale? But at the very least, by exposing the truth, by giving the victims a catharsis. Uh, uh, that in itself is a first step towards uh, uh, achieving justice. And when you're dealing with mass crimes, I think transforming public values, exposing people to the truth, itself sometimes is more important than putting uh, this or that person in, in prison. Are the Western democracies, do you think, right to pursue sanctions against Iran because of the nuclear program? Or will it simply strengthen the regime as exists? I have said for at least a decade that it is a mistake to uh, uh, focus exclusively on the nuclear issue. The problem in Iran is not potential nuclear capability, it's the nature of the regime. Uh, it's the regime that makes the potential of nuclear capability uh, a threat. So until Iran is uh, democratized, until there is the rule of law and respect for human rights, um, Iran will continue to be a, a, a threat to Western interests. And of course, Western governments are not necessarily interested in what is best for the Iranian people. Uh, they're looking at their own uh, interests. But let's look at the example of the military dictatorships in Brazil and Argentina that were both pursuing nuclear programs, which they gave up under civilian rule. And uh, uh, let's look at uh, South Africa under apartheid, the same thing. So the, the point is that a regime that doesn't have democratic legitimacy will by nature become militarized. But because can the West afford to wait for a democratizing process in Iran? I'm not sure what choice there is. Um, the choices seem to be a military confrontation, which is an appalling choice, uh, given what we've seen in the Middle East. And the other choice is uh, appeasement uh, through striking some sort of grand bargain with Iran. And I think that the middle path has to be the empowerment of a civil society and conditioning international acceptance on respect for human rights. Policymakers tend to see human rights as a soft issue 
for a group of naive activists. Well, I think that human rights is at the core of any viable long-term solution to the problem of Iran in the Middle East. But civil society is very strong in Iran. It's just not as strong as the regime. Well, certainly civil society uh, has been many years in the making in Iran. Ironically, thanks to a totalitarian state, Iran has the most vigorous and the most secular civil society uh, uh, in the Middle East. And we saw in 2009, at least a year before the uh, so-called Arab Spring, that uh, the first place in which civil society uh, uh, really succeeded, at least in shaking the pillars of power, uh, was in Iran. And I can tell you that for many years when we were talking about civil society, decision makers in Washington and London were mocking at us uh, and saying that it's impossible to have the kind of velvet revolutions we witnessed in Czechoslovakia and elsewhere in the Islamic Middle East, because people just uh, have to understand the complexities of an entire region that's uh, uh, going through historical transition uh, from tradition to modernity, from authoritarianism to democracy. That transition is going to be a complex, it's going to be uh, messy in places, but I believe that Iran is the furthest advanced uh, in the Middle East and just beneath the surface of this tyrannical regime uh, is a youthful generation uh, uh, which is post-utopian, post-ideological, and Iran has the potential of transforming the, the entire region. And does the new president, Mr. Rouhani, represent change? Well, um, there is some hope that the regime, uh, for its own survival, has to bring about certain reforms. I remain uh, skeptical. Uh, one of the members of the cabinet of Mr. Rouhani, one of the proposed members, if a man by the name of Mr. Poor Mohammadi, who was a member of the death commission that the, in the 1980s executed tens of thousands of people. That, I don't think, is sending the right message uh, to the international community and to the people of Iran. But the point is that uh, Iran cannot be ruled indefinitely through terror uh, and torture and intimidation. And at some point, the regime will have to accommodate the uh, uh, demands of people for greater openness and accountability. Let me ask you about how you started in this human rights business. You joined the prosecutor's office at the War Crimes Tribunal for former Yugoslavia as a very young man. Why did it have such a big impact on you? From a personal point of view, once again, I think it goes back maybe to those childhood experiences that open you to understanding human suffering and injustice. Uh, and in Bosnia, during the uh, first week of my employment with the United Nations, I was deployed in the village of uh, Ahmici, um, in which um, several hundred uh, civilians, including women and children, had been uh, brutally massacred. Uh, and uh, that was a rather rude awakening at the beginning of my career as an international lawyer. Uh, and, and once again, it was a very intimate encounter with what human rights uh, really mean. And it was a very long time ago, 20 years, and those trials are still taking place. In Bosnia, it's often said that justice delayed is justice denied. Why has it all taken so long? Well, what's interesting is that we had the Nuremberg model of justice, which is an army uh, which sits victorious atop the, uh, the vanquished enemy, and the Allied powers could simply march down the streets of Berlin and arrest the entire Nazi leadership. That wasn't the case in the former Yugoslavia. The former Yugoslavia uh, uh, was a situation in which uh, there was a tribunal set up together with appeasement of those responsible for ethnic cleansing. So it's a bit like having Nuremberg after accepting Hitler's annexation of the uh, Eastern territory. And one of the things it was meant to do is promote reconciliation. In fact, all the evidence is it's done the opposite. The, all sides in that war have carefully selected the parts of the evidence that they want to believe, that they believe consistent with their own adopted narrative. It's had the opposite effect. It has hasn't promoted reconciliation, it's further entrenched division, hasn't it? Well, I would begin by saying that justice isn't necessarily about reconciliation. Reconciliation is an uh, uh, incidental byproduct of uh, criminal justice. Uh, but uh, we also have to realize that even in uh, post-war Germany, it took at least one or two generations before the lessons of Nuremberg uh, were, were learned. There was still great sympathy for the Nazis uh, well uh, past the Nuremberg judgment. Uh, but I think it's a mistake to uh, think that we're going to achieve reconciliation simply by prosecuting people from all sides uh, uh, in a conflict. But it's what uh, we were promised when the court was set up, that it would be an instrument of reconciliation. And it, it, it failed in that respect, at least, didn't it? I wouldn't say it failed. I would say that we have to imagine what the world would look like if Slobodan Milosevic was still in power, if Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic were not held uh, accountable uh, in The Hague and were still in positions of power. Uh, 
um, although there are still uh, very serious uh, tensions, uh, the removal uh, of those uh, uh, warmongers and, and uh, what we call you know, the ethnic entrepreneurs that instrumentalize hatred uh, to achieve power, the removal from the political stage, I think, has uh, made uh, 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 peace and stability uh, much more viable uh, in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to uh, uh, embrace each other uh, in some sort of uh, shared humanity, but it does uh, uh, help create a context. Uh, you'll, remember, you'll remember Sir Jeffrey Nice, who led the prosecution, prosecution against Slobodan Milosevic. He said that uh, many of the judges were simply not up to the job. They were often dumped on the tribunal from uh, parts of the world where they weren't properly qualified. Initially, he said, I was very much a believer. Here, for the first time since Nuremberg, was international justice. Then I became cynical. I saw that the judges very often didn't know what was happening and the trials were being ruined. He also said that the, the judges were under uh, pressure to be ethnically even-handed. We've convicted a Serb, we'd better convict a Croat and a Muslim as well to balance it. Did you become disillusioned in any sense? There is a sort of romance with uh, uh, any uh, uh, kind of undertaking which is unprecedented. And in 1993, when the Yugoslav Tribunal was set up, uh, we didn't have any other tribunal to look back at. And once you see the daily reality of uh, um, uh, what it means to uh, uh, organize a trial and a prosecution, um, you begin to um, uh, move towards a kind of a post-romantic phase. Um, so could there be improvements uh, in the tribunal? Absolutely. The uh, quality of judges, the quality of the prosecution, I think uh, uh, many mistakes were made, including the uh, idea that uh, we can achieve justice by indicting people from all sides, mm -hmm. this sort of moral parity uh, uh, theory. And we see what the legacy of that has been. Um, under the tenure of the former prosecutor, uh, Carla Del Ponte, uh, 10 senior non-Serbs were indicted, and there were nine acquittals. Nine out of 10 uh, were, were acquitted. And, well, and since that's... we're talking about that, let me ask you about uh, the time you crossed the floor from the prosecutor's office to the defense, to a defense job. You defended General Ante Gotovina from Croatia. This is a man who was charged uh, with war crimes committed in 1995 against Serbs living in Croatia. Tens of thousands of Serbs fled their homes in the process of the operation that he led. He evaded justice. He went on the run for four years, and yet you came to his defense. Didn't you have any doubts about that? I was asked to join the team. I looked at the evidence. I came to the conclusion that he was innocent and uh, that uh, premonition was vindicated recently when the appeals chamber of the tribunal acquitted him of all charges. And uh, what's important to bear in mind is that Operation Storm in August of 1995 occurred after the Srebrenica genocide in 1995, after the United Nations for three years failed miserably to protect the victims of ethnic cleansing, the Croats and Muslims decided that they have to take matters into their own hands. But what's even more important is that the uh, uh, artillery attack uh, which allowed Croatia to reclaim the uh, Krajina territory uh, was investigated by two separate United Nations missions which both concluded that no war crimes had been committed. But this is not a, this is not a narrative that goes down in Serbia. In Serbia they perceived that the, the uh, the release of, uh, of General Gotovina is absolute proof that this uh, tribunal is loaded against the Serbs. Yes, except that three senior Serbs have also been acquitted. And uh, what's interesting is that there's a lot of criticism leveled against the judges, in particular uh, the president, uh, Theodore Meron, all sorts of conspiracy theories about these acquittals. At the end of the day, I think the, la the, 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 the blame uh, lies squarely at the door of the prosecution, prosecutor's office. Uh, when you don't have sufficient evidence, you don't go to trial, let alone uh, uh, in this sort of context where these acquittals are going to create uh, profound disillusionment. At the end of the day, the judges are not there to appease public opinion in Serbia or Croatia or, or Bosnia. Justice is about guilt or innocence based on uh, objective evidence. Somebody else you're all also working with now is um, uh, the son of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam. You, you're representing the Libyan judicial system, uh, arguing for the right of the Libyan courts to try Saif al-Islam there in Tripoli. The Libyan novelist Hisham Matar has written that Libyans used to be afraid of a brutal police state, they're now afraid of the absence of the state. Without an army and a police force to protect the people and guard the independence of the civil servants and the elected officials, a new conflict is brewing. The state doesn't really exist in Libya. How can Saif al-Islam 
possibly get a fair trial from a country that is now run by independent, unaccountable militias. Well, I'm not at liberty to discuss this case, which is pending before the International Criminal Court, but I think the basic principle, uh, which is enshrined in the statute of the International Criminal Court, is that where national courts are able and willing to prosecute, they must be given uh, primacy. The International Criminal Court is only there where national justice uh, is not possible. Uh, and and national justice is surely not possible in, in Libya under the current circumstances. Well, um, it's a question of uh, understanding that any society that is emerging from crimes against humanity and mass atrocities is not going to have the judicial system of Sweden or Canada. Uh, it's going to be a society which needs judicial capacity building, which needs sufficient time. Uh, it's to, not going to come early enough to save Al Islam to give him a fair trial, is it? Well, uh, I think the question, once again, can be put in the context, for example, of Rwanda, uh, in which, uh, despite the fact that there was a UN tribunal for Rwanda, there were 130,000 people uh, in prison um, uh, after the 1994 genocide. Uh, and the Rwandan judicial system, which is in a far, far worse situation than Libya, uh, was given the opportunity over time uh, to uh, manage these cases. And I think that they have done a, a relatively uh, decent job. Let me ask you about genocide. Uh, you've done a lot of work on this in recent days, and you've said genocide has become a trophy which bestows the crown of ultimate importance and suffering on certain people. Do you think the, the charge of genocide is banded around too, too, too freely now? I remember during the uh, mass murder in Rwanda in 1994, the big issue was, was this genocide or was it not genocide? And while this debate was taking place in the United Nations, a million people were slaughtered in three months in Rwanda. Uh, and then in the case of Darfur in the Sudan, uh, the US Secretary of State Colin Powell said, well, we're not going to deny the label of genocide as the Clinton administration did with respect to Rwanda. We will call this by its right. So this is but highly we, politicized. But, but we will still not do anything. This, this is, is a problem. It's been taken out of the judicial realm, realm and put in the hands of uh, political actors. It is, it's not only that, but uh, we uh, have created this illusion of progress in the United Nations, in academic circles and other uh, uh, elite uh, contexts, where we think that symbolic condemnation of mass atrocities somehow represents progress and it becomes really a substitute for more effective action. It doesn't really matter what you call the murder of a million people in Rwanda or Darfur. What is important is whether there's any meaningful action to protect those victims. The uh, QC Philip Sands, who you'll know, is a great champion of international justice like you. He says these courts are a world of laws that are like spiders webs through which the big flies pass freely and the little ones get caught. It's true, isn't it? We're not going to see uh, American soldiers or British soldiers arraigned at the International Criminal Court. If you look at the list of uh, indictees at the ICC, they're all African. When are we going to see a system uh, it, which will hold uh, people, for, citizens of powerful countries uh, to scrutiny uh, the way they do citizens of uh, smaller countries? I have a slightly different take on this because I remember the complaint that people had about the Yugoslav tribunal having been established only because the victims were Europeans. Another complaint is that we're setting up all these courts and exercising jurisdiction in relation to Africa. Well, I would say good for the African people that there is an institution uh, that is uh, 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 addressing the grave injustices that are being committed on that, on that continent. But, uh, but it uh, remains a weakness, doesn't it, that China, Russia, the United States, three permanent members of the Security Council, refused to sign up to the ICC. That is clearly a weakness. And once again, we have to understand the rise of global justice as a historical process. Twenty years ago, we didn't have a single jurisdiction uh, to punish uh, 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 genocidal murderers. And today we have the remarkable precedent of the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, uh, and a number of other uh, uh, instances where we have at least some measure of justice rather than uh, and not at all. And I must also say that it may be more fashionable to uh, condemn uh, the uh, uh, Americans uh, for war crimes, but I think the biggest source of injustice is the failure of the United States and the Western powers to uh, intervene in situations like Rwanda, in situations like Darfur. That to me is a much bigger problem for global justice. Thank you for speaking to us on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.